Welcome. You're listening to Sports Ecom 101, the show where we discuss sports topics from a business perspective. I'm your host, Edward Brown, along with my co-host, Vern Glenn of CBS affiliate KBI. No! <laughs> and Russell Jackman. Yes. Uh, at each commercial break, we're going to ask a sports trivia question. Uh, today's trivia theme is famous football games. Famous right now, if they're famous, games. you guys should know all everything about every famous game, right? Well, well, well t- test our knowledge. If it's from, you know, the, the 30s, I might not be so good. Yeah, well, I don't know how many famous games there were in the 30s. I was, I was, I was not at the greatest game ever played, the 1958 Colts-Giants yeah. overtime game. I was not uh, – not there. Yeah, where Chuck Bednarik uh, knocked out uh, Frank uh, Gifford. The, that, yeah, that, that was the Giants-Eagles uh, NFL championship game. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. My, my yeah, bad. <laughs> this is the Colts game. This is the one where, where uh, Alan Amici crossed over from the one and uh, won the national, the, the, the NFL championship. Well, you know, it's so funny. There's, I mean, there's been, I, I, I think there's been a lot more games uh, since then that have been uh, Probably a little more exciting. I mean, that was a, that was a very very good game, and not, not to put anything down on that. But you know, it's like each time, uh, you know, there's like a new. Oh, this guy's the greatest player ever. Oh, of course, yeah. You know? yeah. And I mean, there's always going to be somebody uh, yep. a little better on that. All right. Uh, this segment of Sports Econ 101 is sponsored by Pacific Private Money, providing mortgage investments that are still currently yielding seven and a half percent. Seven and a half percent. Can you believe it? The wow. Seven and a half percent. It, yeah. It, no losses. I mean, I, I, it's just hard to imagine. Yeah, it's just out, 7% if, if last out week. There, he didn't uh, stutter. Seven and a half percent. Seven and a half percent. Seven last week, so. Well, it's, it's, it's hovering between seven to seven and a half percent. So all those suckers that invested last week, they could have gone no, off. No, no, no. They'll, no, they'll just, because it, it fluctuates. You know, it's like a money market fund from that end of it. So check Should've them waited. out. At PacificPrivateMoney.com. Stay with us. You are listening to Sports Econ 101. Don't touch that dial. We are going to be right back. What? I was ready. Welcome back to Sports Econ 101. Edward Brown here, along with Vern Glenn, who's just about as even keeled as one can get. And then we have Mr. Russell Jackman, who's a little more um, excitable. Let's put it that way. (laughs) You don't pay me for the even keeled stuff. Yeah. yeah. Hey, we gotta have we gotta have you know a little bit of everything, right? I'm I'm more right wing, you're more left wing, and Vern, you're kind of balanced, you know. You kind of go between the two. Yeah, I kind of yeah, I kind of teeter totter. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, um, so a couple things. Uh, do you, uh, what do you think? The Chiefs looked pretty good last night, didn't they? Now we're recording the show on Tuesday. Too good after. <laughs> it looks well, too here, good. Here, here's the question. I mean. What team is going to stand in the way, at least in the AFC, of the Kansas City Chiefs? Yeah. I have no answer. After Silence. they just mantled <laughs> Baltimore like that, yeah. that the Baltimore was probably the best chance yeah. of seeing somebody stand up to them and push them back. And when they had them within a touchdown, I thought maybe so. But you know what's scary about Kansas City is that they have no – shortage of weapons when they go to the ta- eligible tackle and they're able to get a, uh, a, a touchdown off of him you know forget it if the if the tackles are capable of catching touchdowns i don't know what what you, can you do. know so it's funny that that play seems to almost always work I, i'm i'm trying to remember when it didn't, and it was only because maybe it's not eligible. eligible why the defense pays no attention to that yeah you know? that's what i'm saying yeah, the, the, the defense seems to, like, go, oh, okay, that's fine. The tackle's yeah. eligible. We'll, we'll just pay no attention to that. And then it goes right to them. I never understood that either. I mean, it is a good and, and they announce it before the play. So, yeah. So is, is, is eligible, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it is. it could be a good decoy. And I, I think I've seen that a couple of times where, you know, they – because About 80% of the time it winds up going to the tackle. That's true. I mean, do you remember uh, old Refrigerator Perry got in there? Yeah, they, you tackle. know, he got it instead of Walter Payton, though. That was really an injustice. Hey, let's hey, let's let's okay. just for fun. Let's let's, okay. let's let's run through the schedule because they got the Patriots up next at home. Patriots okay. come in to uh, Kansas City next week. That's a win. That's a that's a win for the Chiefs. Chiefs never lose at home. Then, then they, then they, then they host the Raiders. That, that's a win. They'll beat the Raiders. Then they're at Buffalo on October. Buffalo 15th. is going to be a Buffalo's tough contest. 
I think Buffalo's tough at home, but I mean that, you know, but it's, it, you know, it's, it's maybe the sun shines on a dog's butt and, and, and uh, Buffalo wins that one. Then they, then they go to Denver. That's a get that one. That's Denver's, Denver's a mess. Yeah. Then, then they host the Jets. That's a win. Mm -hmm. Then they, then they host the Carolina Panthers. That's a win. Yeah. Then they have a bye week. And then on That's the a win. Then, yes. Then on the 22nd of November, they, uh, they're, they're, they're at the Raiders. That's a win. That's, yeah, then, okay. then, oh, then, then they're at Tampa Bay. So that's Brady against Patrick Mahomes. Yeah, that'll be a fascinating matchup. That, now, yeah. You don't think the Raiders at home will uh, give them too much of a challenge? You know, that's you always have to throw out the 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 rule book and the 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 stat sheet when Raiders play Kansas City. I mean, all kinds of sure. wild things can happen. Usually, it's the Raiders' mo. To, to, to really, really be competitive that first half, but something happens in the third quarter. It's, it's a play or two. It's a, it's a, it's a pre-snap penalty. It's, 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 it's a blown assignment in coverage. So, so something happens that lets the Raiders open the door. And, and, and usually that happens, you know, when they play the Chiefs. And that's how, you know, the Chiefs kind of run away with a big third quarter. And then they, then they, then they yeah. put that to bed. That's how it, You know what, the, the whole idea about the home field advantage, you know, with most of uh, stadiums not having either any any uh, fans or very few. How much of a home field is it? You know, I mean, they know the turf a little better, obviously. Yeah, but. I mean, talk to uh, the Meadowlands, the owners of the Meadowlands. <laughs> <about it. laughs> I will. I will say this for the Raiders. I mean, they th that's that's the one team I think that really that really loses out when they have no fans. You know that black hole, and, and oh, yeah. they just feed off that energy and everything. The the whole Raider mystique and all the costume. I've heard some players being interviewed that say that once they get into the game, they really don't notice the crowd anymore. They're just they really are focused on what's on the field, and they just they lose that track of of how what fans are what noise fans are making anymore. Oh, those are those are direct quotes from Raider players. No, just from some other Just players. in general. Oh, okay. Yeah, All right. But also, you know, maybe when they're on the field, but when they're, let's say, you know, if they're offensive player and defense is in, I mean, they could kind of get jacked up while they're on the sidelines, one would think. You know, it's funny because you're talking about, like, the rivalries with uh, the Raiders and the Chiefs. I mean, I remember them, bitter rivals, before the, the Pittsburgh uh, Steeler Raider right, one, right. you know, and with Len Dawson and uh, George Blanda and Daryl LaMonica and all that. I mean, it was, it was that's, that's, that's because the Raiders and the Chiefs were they, they were really yeah. good in the late '60s. Yeah. Was, they, they were they were really really good. They were just they were like this exactly like, all the time. Yeah. But um, but so so they so 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 they're at the Raiders and they're at Tampa Bay. I mean, who knows what will happen to that one? Then they then they host the Broncos. That's a win. They're yeah. at Miami. That. That, that that's a that's a head scratcher. Then they're at New Orleans. Uh, maybe New Orleans has 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 it right. I mean that could be a shootout. Then they host the Falcons, and then they host the Chargers to close out the the regular. I see them being fourteen and two. Yeah, they yeah, yeah. They, yeah. That, that 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 that, right. that has the feel of a fourteen and two team. Although right now um, you just you just don't see any weaknesses. This first uh, this first quadrant of the season. The only thing I can say is that one good game against the Jets, they may have to go down, you know, two or three deep in their, you know, in, in their uh, uh, thanks to the stadium. You know, they might have to find themselves playing backup tight ends, backup running yeah. backs, backup wide receivers. Well, it'll be interesting to see how uh, how the Falcons choose a different way to lose. Oof. I mean, <laughs> just week after week. I mean, it's almost like they've got this Charlie Blount Brown cloud over their head. Yeah, I'm 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 a little bit surprised by that. I'm also surprised that the Vikings are winless. I mean, I, I it just I just expected that. Especially them. with Dalvin Cook running for almost 200 yards yeah. last week. Yeah. yeah, but they they I, as a Niner fan, I'm really glad we didn't pick up Kirk Cousins. He isn't showing yeah. to be like he was really kind of a fluke in Washington. And it just goes to show you that. Almost every team is pretty good with a quarterback that has time. But when a quarterback doesn't have time, I mean, I'm, I'm talking about more than two seconds. I mean, these quarterbacks, they could just, they could just rip you to shreds. Unless when, it's Lamar Jackson. Then, then you have a guy who doesn't need any time because he can just put, tuck the ball and just 
run on down. Well, they well the, the Chiefs had his number on Monday. He only had 95 yards uh, passing on Monday night, and and he even said it himself after the game. Yeah, the Chiefs, you know, they're, they're my kryptonite right now because I, I just can't I just can't beat. There are a lot of people's kryptonite. Right. All right. Hey right. guys, we're going to cut to uh, our first commercial break trivia question, talking famous football games here, and I remember watching this one and going, I I can't believe this is going on. Okay, 1978. Uh, all this quarterback had to do to win the game was kneel down and run out the clock. Instead, a handoff was called from the sidelines. And, and if you listen to it, you find out the coach was just so, like, we're going to stick it to this team. We're, mm -hmm. we're not just going to do a kneel down. We're going to hand it off, kind of stick it to them, right? But, of course, uh, the uh, quarterback attempted to give the ball to Larry Zonka. Oh, but yes. It was, but it was fumbled and ran back for the winning touchdown uh, winning score by a future NFL head coach. And a current college football coach. Ah, so okay. So I already know the answer. Yeah. Okay, so here, here's the uh, trivia question. Who was the quarterback who handed off to Zonka and who ran the fumble back for the winning touchdown? All right, okay. that's, that's our trivia question, all right? All right. Uh, email edward at uh, sportsecon101.com the answer to that question. Uh, 1978? Uh, quarterback attempted to give the ball to Larry Zonka, but it was fumbled and ran back for the winning score by a future NFL head coach. Uh, the two-part question is, who was the quarterback who handed off to Zonka and mm -hmm. who ran it back for the winning touchdown? Stay with us. You're listening to Sports Econ 101. Uh, don't touch that dial, as Russell Jackson <laughs> likes to hear. We're going to be right back. Welcome back to Sports Econ 101. Edward Brown here along with Vern Glenn and Russell Jackman. 1978, there was a famous game where all this quarterback had to do to win the game was kneel down and run out the clock. Instead, he handed the ball off because it was uh, called by the sidelines. And In fact, if I remember correctly, Zonka was interviewed later on going, what are you doing? <laughs> How can this call me? Don't hand the ball to me. Uh, but anyway, this was later on in his career. Uh, it was fumbled and ran back for the winning score by a future NFL head coach. So question, who was the quarterback who handed off to Zonka and who was, ran it back for the winning touchdown? Now, let's start off with the second part. Vern, who ran it back for the winning touchdown? Herm Edwards ran it back for a touchdown. That's right. Now, but, but the joke was Sargic. Was Joe Pasarczyk, that's right. Yeah. Very that, good. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That, 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 very, very famous. Yeah, it's so funny because I, I really just happened to remember watching that game and going, wait, wait, I don't get it. Why, why, there's a few seconds left. They're going, what are they doing? And then yeah. suddenly it's like the unthinkable happened. It was sort of the the, uh, uh, the, the sort of like the Atlanta Falcons of today. Unfortunately, they're kind of getting uh, getting, getting a bad rap. But uh, now, when I, when I, when I, what was what, what was the better fumble? The uh, the, the 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 Giants fumble with Joe Pasarczyk, or the butt fumble uh, for the New York Jets? Oh, and Mark yeah. Sanchez. Remember the butt fumble? Yes. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty good. Or, or one of my favorite plays was uh, the Thanksgiving one where the odd snow in Dallas when Leon let, the, all he oh, had yeah. let it go. But oh, it yeah, that, that was great. <laughs> that was great. And then there's the fumble Ruski, too. Oh, yes. Fumble, fumble Ruski. Um, Steve, Steve Spurrier in his bag of tricks of offensive uh, gimmicks. I'm trying to remember right. the fumble Ruski. Fumble Ruski. This, is what, this is when Spurrier was the head coach of uh, at Florida. And it changed the rules. It changed the rules so you can't advance. Well, very fumble. similar to Stabler, uh, you know, the Holy Roller. No, but, the, but well, Stabler with Holy Roller, I mean, he was running and then and then kind of it, yeah. the, the, the ball like like slipped and went forward, forward, and then, they, and then finally it, it, it went to the end zone and then Dave Casper fell on it for a yeah. touchdown. But uh, but in the fumble ruski, I mean that was a design trick play where, where where the ball is snapped and then it's on the ground, and 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 then and then a lineman picks it up and runs around for a touchdown. The gotcha. Fumble, the fumble ruski play. Fumble ruski, I love that name too. Um, so uh, let, let's uh, go on to a, a. I just happened to notice a uh, Lamelo Ball. Um, so now he's going. Yeah, and Russell shaking his head. No, I guess anything to do with uh, uh, the balls um, is a little nerve wracking, right? Because Lavar. Well, what's nerve wracking is that I've seen some uh, projected draft stuff where they say the Warriors would draft Lamelo Ball. 
If the Warriors draft LaMelo Ball, I may stop being a Warriors fan. <laughs> now, that's really because of his dad, not because of LaMelo, right? And no, it would be because that would be a franchise-destroying move. That would be the equivalent of getting um, uh, 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 Sam Bowie for, uh, <laughs> for, for the Portland Trailblazers. Okay. I just can't. I I I just can't see. I I just can't see Bob Myers, Steve Kerr, uh, 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 and 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 the ownership group in a room going back and forth, and then they come out with, "Yeah, let's get Ball. Yeah, he's the one for us." I just I just don't I just don't see it. Thank now, you. I'm glad. Right now, glad. that's just that's just up in the air. I mean, that he's not going there. Right. No, the Warriors don't draft Edward uh, 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 James um, uh, uh, Wiseman. James Wiseman. Wiseman? Yeah. yeah, if we don't get, draft James Wiseman, then I think the Warriors will have destroyed their future as a franchise. Yeah, James Wiseman can help them because uh, he's he's got the size, he's got the wingspan, he's got the athletic ability. They just need to they just need to work on the game up here. And there's no other eligible centers. If you look at the draft, the next eligible center is going to probably be drafted around 10 or 11 in the draft. They just This is a draft that's full of small forwards and shooting guards, and that's the one thing the Warriors really don't need are, are small forward shooting guards. He could, be, he could be another – he could be a potential uh, Andrew Bogut with scoring ability. He could be. And less injuries. That was the big Unless, problem yeah, with Bogut yeah. was he yeah. already had a lot of mileage on him <laughs> when they brought him on board. But what was your point about LaMelo as far as – Oh, just kind of interesting. It's like I mean, he says, hey, I'll play anywhere. You know, he would be a good fit. Uh, but I'm well, just he kind of wondering... what Lonzo's had to go through. So I think he's yeah. also learned a little bit about, like, where if you go in there. But remember, his dad was saying that he thought LaMelo would wind up being a better point guard than Steph Curry. Well, well of course he's going to say, you know, he, he, yeah, anything to get to that. Uh, I think LaMelo's gotten to the point where, like, Dad, shut up. Yeah. <laughs> just, just don't say anything. I'll make this happen on my own. I don't need you, which is probably well. Can you, can you imagine you know, if you, you're trying to do your career and you have your father kind of interfere like that? I mean, just just him just being associated with him, you just it, it's two strikes against you. Have you know, you never done anything. Dad? What's that? Have you met my dad? <laughs> no, I haven't. All right then. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, try try sitting down and having a cup of coffee with Todd Marinovich and talk ah. to his dad. Boy, you talk what what a what, you know. You have a cup of coffee, but you can't have a Big Mac. Right. <laughs> you realize that he had never had a Big Mac until he went to college. Yeah. Boy, that'll uh, that'll kind of mess up your stomach, won't it? Marinovich. Well, well, well it's just well, that he's so sheltered, everything. so programmed to be a quarterback that he didn't have time even to take him out to a fast food restaurant. Well. Fast food's not really good for you, so that's not so bad, right? No, but tell me a normal American yeah. teenager that hasn't been to McDonald's. No, that you know, it's, <laughs> I, don't, I didn't go there until I was an adult, but uh, that was the, no, seriously, just it was just one of those kind of weird things. But I get, but I get your point. I get your my point. kids have made up where you left off. <laughs> you know, it's funny, kind of, it's kind of sad though. It reminds me, um, do you guys remember the old TV show Dennis the Menace? With Jay yeah. Jordan? So apparently uh, he was maybe – Hank I think was, him. That's right, Hank Ketchum, very good. So played, he was by, raised, played, by, played by Jay North. Jay North, yeah. So yeah. I think he was raised by his aunt, if I'm not mistaken. And his aunt had this attitude of, uh, my son is a star, you know, my, my nephew is a star. I mean, you can't, you can't talk to him. I mean, he wasn't allowed to play with other kids, even the kids on the set. That was Marazovic's life. Yeah, so, I mean, that, that'll really mess you up. If it didn't have to do with football, he wasn't allowed to do anything. Yeah. Have anything to do with it. Well, so, gosh, you know, and it's funny because think about what's going on with COVID and the kids going to school and being isolated or not going to school, let's say, and being isolated almost in the same way, right? That, I mean, that's why they have to have that interaction. Yeah, but my kids can still go out and get some McNuggets if they want. I mean, you know, it's true. that was all. He was basically kept prisoner by his father till he was, you know, 18 years old. And then his father lets him out, and then he just goes completely hog wild. It's like the Jack Mormons, you know, that they, they, yeah. they spend their whole life 
being Mormon, and then they get that chance to to go crazy, and then they they run away and they never come back. Yeah. Uh, well, and then they're the shunned Amish. by the church. Yeah, or the Amish. The yeah, Amish. yeah. So you get it from both ends, then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not not good. Um, so a uh, baseball. What what do you guys think of uh, wild card series games? Hey, bring it on! Hey, yeah. best of, all these best of three series. Uh, man, I. I, I, I love it. Have we, we, Bring we, on the robotic umpires. Uh, Giants got screwed. Before <laughs> you move on, Giants were screwed well, by talking, that, <laughs> that ump. You talking about the, just the, are you talking about just the last? Yeah, that or, last game. That no, ump. The, no, no, I mean the last strike. No, no that I, whole game. I, 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 was at, I was at the game. I mean, uh, Edward, it, it, it happened with – it happened with multiple at bats for the Giants, multiple. Okay. And, and for whatever reason, these these pitches that were down and away, he was calling strikes, and uh, and just left the Giants batters just shaking their heads as as they walked back to the dugout. Bring on the robotic ups! And, 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 and it, it, I would have liked to have seen Mike Yastrzemski have an, an an at bat. He was on deck when the season ended. Yeah. But 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 you know what? Hey, the Giants lost. Four of their last five, they just, they just, they just weren't good enough to do it. They just weren't good enough. Yeah, it's heartbreaking. So, so, so that's that's the heartbreaking thing. And then I was, I was talking to Evan Longoria after the game, and he said, you know what, you know, baseball is built on failure. That's why it's so gratifying when you win. And uh, and it's just going to take some time to 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 kind of get over this one. But fact remains, their next game, Cactus League. Next February. I yeah, just, but we were so close to having the yeah. Giants face the Dodgers in the playoffs. You the realize that. Has, and then that would have been for the first time ever. in the. I was going to say that's, that hasn't happened since New York, since the teams yeah. were in New York. So may, maybe the ump uh, kind of had to – because I don't want to see that. No, you don't want to see the Giants against the Dodgers. <laughs> Another Tim Donahue type of uh, situation. I was also mentioning how it was weird that the Golden State Warriors never faced the Lakers in the playoffs, not since the, the early 70s. You know, the yeah. Warriors have never faced the Lakers. So you have these two huge rivalries, the Giants-Dodgers, they've never faced each other, and the Lakers-Warriors yeah. have never faced no, each other. No, you got to have that. Hey, guys, going to do the uh, second trivia question here. In probably the greatest comeback win in NFL history, and I remember exactly where I was watching this. So do too. I. Frank Reich. Yep. Subbing for Buffalo Bills starter Jim Kelly led the Bills to an overtime playoff victory after being down 35 to 3 early at in the, the half. half. And they told you at the halftime, don't bother coming back. Don't bother watching. <laughs> the rest That's of the right. game. And that made me decide I'm going to watch the rest of this game. Yes, I, exa I, I exactly. Left, I, I was living in San Francisco. I, uh, I, I walked out at halftime and figured, okay, this is over. I went down the street to Kabuki Hot Springs for a yeah. massage. Wow, and then, and then and then coming out, I just walked by this you know sports bar, just yeah, you know, just just peering in, and yeah. uh, that's when I found out unbelievably the comeback had occurred. All right, crazy. So the the question was, who was wearing number sixty eight? Ah. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no. Okay, who who was the uh, who was the Bills opposition that day? Uh, that's our trivia question. Stay with us, Sports Econ One Hundred One. I'll be right back. Welcome back to Sports Econ 101. One more time, Edward Brown here along with Vern Glenn and Russell Jackman. Second trivia question. You guys knew this one right away. Frank Wright subbing uh, for Buffalo Bills starter Jim Kelly led the Bills to an overtime playoff victory after being down 35-3 to you know, on January 3rd, 1993. Who did the Bills beat? Mr. Jackman? Well... You know, I really was rooting for Warren Moon at the time. I wanted to see him go to a Super Bowl. Yeah. And and I felt it was a sad situation that, you know, he couldn't get the job done. It wasn't his fault. It was it his defense that completely defense. let him down. Yeah. But when the announcers were shouting, don't even bother. Go watch some other game. I was like, something tells me that <laughs> you guys are saying don't watch. I better stay tuned. And as I sat there watching, I was like saying, they could come back in this, you know, because they scored right away. After, didn't they kick, get a kickoff return to start with, to start the second half? I'm trying to remember. I don't remember. I just remember all those touchdowns that Frank Wright uh, threw against. I think they got a kickoff return to start the second half, and I was like, okay, you know, now sure. it's 35, you know, uh, uh, a 10, and, and yeah. maybe, you know, they get a couple more touchdowns. They stay back in it. 
and lo and behold, that's what we had. Now, now, now the audience uh, is, we heard you mention Warren Moon, but uh, before he played for the Vikings, who did he play for? Let's see. Before it was the Vikings. Who did the Bills beat? Who did Oilers? Oilers? in that game. The Houston Oilers, yeah. There you go. That's good. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yes. Um, so, Russell, um, you know, it's funny, right after we did last week's show, uh, it was really sad to hear the passing of Gail Sayers. Um, he, I, was, I was young when he was uh, finishing off, or finished off his career, but watching him was just, and then he's just incredible, just poetry in motion. And to see the old uh, film, film clips of him, uh, kind of very Barry Sanders-like, you know. Uh, I, believe, I believe George Hallis called him magic. In motion, magic in motion, yeah, and, yep. and the Kansas Comet, Co the, yes, the Kansas Comet, Kansas yep. Comet. yeah, yeah. He, and then he, there he, was the, the whole thing with Brian song mm -hmm. with, with with James Con, yeah, yeah, yeah. But his whole thing with Brian Piccolo and and yeah. that whole relationship too, you know, it was he was, I don't think you can talk about that era of football without mentioning how special Gale Sayers was to football's existence mm -hmm. as a star, as, as, a, as, as a guy that showed the human side of football yeah. more than a, a guy. A good amb ambassador for the sport. Yeah. I agree. This, yeah, I agree. Was that? Speaking and of then, ambassadors, wrestling lost one of its great ambassadors in the sense that we lost Road Warrior Animal, who is John Laurinaitis, the, the father of... Uh, of uh, uh, Lauren Itis, who was uh, with uh, uh, the Rams for a while. Oh, remember. yeah. How, how old was he? 60. Yee. 60 and died of a heart attack. And mm -hmm. he was one of, the, one of my favorite wrestlers of all time. I mean, again, you guys aren't the big wrestling fans in the way that I am, but the Road Warriors or the Legion of Doom were two of the most, they were like the Wilt Chamberlains mm -hmm. of their era. Of, of wrestling. They were, they were the most awesome tag team in that early 80s time frame. And they would just come in, they would play the song Iron Man from Black Sabbath. And before the song was done, they were already, they've already beaten up their opponents and walked back to the, <laughs> it's true, it's true. Usually before they could even finish the middle jam, they were done and, and back in the locker room. And I'm trying to remember, they, they they didn't use any prop. I mean, they didn't, like, pick up a chair and just, like, bash you over the head with it. No. They picked the, their opponents up and threw them into the chairs. Yeah. <laughs> the right. There you go. And then, you know, they would they, – they, their raw strength – you know, back then in the early 80s, you still had a lot of guys with beer belly and yeah. the big guts and stuff like that. But the Road Warriors were the epitome of the chiseled, super strong, pumped up, probably steroid adult, yeah. you know, like monsters that mm -hmm. would just completely lay waste. They wouldn't just sit there and do arm locks and headlocks and things like that. They would just go in, punch the guys, kick them, clothesline them, press them over their heads, throw them outside the ring, and that was the end of it. So, you know, yeah, they, but like, as you've mentioned like before, Mike Tyson. Just, I think that they, they, they were like the way Mike Tyson was, where they would just come in, beat somebody up really fast, and then just go. Okay, but like, as, as, like like they had a plane to catch. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, and, and as you mentioned, With their bare before, hands they would catch the Russell, plane. By the you, way, uh, yeah, you, yeah, um, you. But but as we've talked about before, it, it's not it's not fake, but it's staged. So uh, the as, Road Warriors as, were as, pretty as, well as, known for being what they call in the business stiff. Stiff. They, stiff. They would give these guys a real pounding. They, most people know the Warriors for the reputation of, of once they would get in the ring, they would hit you pretty damn hard to make sure that you didn't get up and pretend like the, the no-sell, where you, you, you pretended like it didn't hurt. These guys really hurt a number of people. Yeah, so then, as, as, as Hulk Hogan told me many times, it's predetermined. Predetermined, yeah. yeah. Yes. But the thing is, when you get hit like that, you know, if you know you're going to go up against them, I mean, how do you how do you deal with that if you know? Well, shoot, man, I'm really actually going to get hurt. You know that because that could end your own career. You take a bunch of Percocets. There you go. You know, and you take you take some Valiums, and you take you know uh, probably a, a half a, a, a quart of uh, whiskey before yeah. you get in the so ring. So when did the Road Warriors lose matches? 
Um, well, when they got older, you know, and 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 also they lost a really unfortunate. Not that anyone cares, but they actually lost their titles on a count out, which is never supposed to happen because oh. the AWA wanted them out, and then they became part of the WCW and the WWE, where they became really huge stars. So. Yeah, I, I, I got to say the one thing I've appreciated, even on just watching commercials of, of wrestling nowadays, the acrobats, you know, the talent that these guys are showing is really phenomenal. It's very entertaining. Yeah, yeah. well, the Road Warriors <laughs> ushered a lot of that in. So that's why I'm bringing them up because the, 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 the Road Warriors helped usher in that era in a way that you could say like maybe like Magic and Bird ushered in a different era yeah. of basketball, you know, for the NBA. That's that's the significance of a how, of how often do these guys practice these moves, you know, with a live body, so to speak? Well, you know, three hundred and fifty days, my time. friend. Well, what's that? Three you need to watch the movie by my my uh, cohort yeah. on my podcast, Evan Ginsberg. He wrote, he made a movie called Three Hundred and Fifty Days. Yeah. And that's because most wrestlers are on the road. 350 out of the 365 days a year because some of these some of these moves you know where you're on the top turnbuckle doing a flip landing on a guy landing on a table i mean that's a lot of precision and some well, of these you know, guys you, lack you, that precision well you, 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 correct me if i'm wrong mr jackman but uh, but you, you have it you have an event on a particular day but two or three days before then i mean you're in there choreographing and just and just is just working on the moves Am I, is, isn't that correct not usually you don't get three days ahead of time you get usually the afternoon you get the part afternoon of the before? afternoon the yeah. afternoon before so yeah. that's what it's, it's like, really yeah. the years of training that you build up before you get in the ring that do that it's not you don't learn it all just before you know three or four days before an event you you already know that stuff before you get in the ring or you get clobbered wow yeah. But then your opponent opponent has to cho choreograph it with you to get hit a certain way. I mean, do, do they use a lot of trampolines and stuff like that? No, training? no. And you'd be surprised how many of these guys just wing it. You know, they just they've been in the ring so long. They just they go, okay, yeah, I remember back. You know, a year ago we did this this match where where I did this, and some of these guys are figuring this out like at the time they're being tossed in the middle of the air. Aren't you know? they communicating sometimes in the yeah. middle? I mean, uh, okay. yes. Okay, that's they what do, I thought. but they, but it's more or less like a like a routine they already know. They yeah. already know these like subroutines, so they patch them all together. So it isn't like saying, "Okay, now I'm going to throw you through a table, and now I'm going to do this to you, yeah. and I'm going to yeah. do that." It, it's it's more it's more like, uh, "Okay, we're going to do the fence post," and then yeah, or they or they already know what that means. Do a finish, you know. Right. It's time to do a high spot. It's and then they know what things they are they're going to do. So they have that already set, but a lot of it is already stuff that's planned well before they ever even meet each other. They already know how to do yeah. these certain things. So like, how often are things ad-libbed? Yes, constantly. Constantly? Constantly. I mean, I can see where someone, a, a, move, a certain move happens and someone gets hurt and then he has to kind of like, hey, whoa, we gotta take it easy on me. For that's the ref's job. <laughs> that's the ref's job. Ref goes, talks to the guy, finds out he's hurt. Tells the other guy, "Hey, this other guy's hurt. We got to end this match now." Mm -hmm. Okay, you know, or, or or buy him some time because sometimes, like when they get in those arm bars, it's like it's like we're as the audience we're sitting there waiting, waiting. You don't waiting. see those anymore, do you? No, no, no. no. And it's it, all it, high it, spots now. It's all high spots and 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 big moves. Well, moves. for the audience, for the audience, explain what a high spot is. A high spot is when someone jumps off the top rope or or does a huge body slam that you know through a table or something that is supposed to get the fans to all go crazy. And that used to be a finisher. It used to be the end of the match. You know, when a guy would pile drive somebody. Mm -hmm. And now you have guys just get up right after that. And they have to pile drive them another five or six times, you know, to get them to quote unquote sell long enough to get a pin. So nobody right. ever wants to show that any of these moves quote unquote hurt them. So they don't sell the moves. Therefore, back in the day, you could have somebody just punch you and you would sell it by falling backwards, yeah. and pretending like you got, you know, your head cracked in half. And now nobody buys that. Nobody buys the idea yeah. that a single punch 
would knock a guy out. So yeah, but yeah. but a real pile driver where they kind of jump up and land on your head is. If you notice, you don't see those anymore. Yeah, I mean that's got to be like really dangerous. <laughs> it is really dangerous, and guys yeah. like Stone especially Cold if you do it wrong. Yeah. 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 Well, I remember the old Boston Crab. That was that's less dangerous. Yeah, but still, that that's a hard one to get out of. <laughs> it is. It's it's in real life. I've done it in jujitsu, and it's it 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 really can finish a match. Gotcha. Okay. Hey guys, getting to our last commercial break trivia question here. Uh, this one's kind of interesting. We'll see if you know this one. In 1985, Monday Night Football game, Redskins Joe Theismann took a flea flicker lateral from John Riggins. But before he could deliver the ball downfield, he was hit by two superb defenders. On replay, viewers saw one of the most gruesome sights oh, ever on football. Oh. Yeah, fans. Oh, I yeah. That. Theismann suffered a very nasty compound fracture. I think he was out at least one week, wasn't he? Alex Smith <laughs>, laughs at that, though. Yeah, that, that, good point. Uh, this injury ended the quarterback's career. Who were the two defenders who combined for this memorable sack? That's our trivia right. question. I, you guys will for I, sure I can, know one. I, I can think of one. Well, yeah. I, I, can, I can think of two, so I'll, I'll, I'll go with that. Okay. And, and everyone remembers the first one where he put his hands on his helmet like, oh, my gosh, what am I looking at here? All right? So uh, basically, who were the two football players who rubbed out Joe Theismann's career with uh, – with, with they ended up uh, – in fact, the movie The Blind Side, they started off talking about that, which I guess is now like a famous – uh, you know, the, was it the, the left guard who, for a, for a right-handed quarterback who has to cover the blind side? That's right. right? Yeah, yeah, it they, is. yeah. The, the high, highest-paid lineman on the uh, on the offensive line. Yeah, and he ought to be because he's got to protect that guy. And uh, if you're left-handed, you got to have the right tackle be that. Okay, exactly. which I always wondered, why do they call them tackles if they're on offense? Doesn't make sense, you know. They're 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 guards, or they're not supposed to tackle. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They don't tackle. All right, stay with us, Sports Econ One Hundred and One. We'll be right back with some closing comments. Well, welcome back to Sports Econ One Hundred and One. Last time for today, I'm Edward Brown, your host, along with Russell Jackman and Vern Glenn. Third trivia question: Nineteen eighty-five Monday Night Football game. Redskins Joe Theismann took a flea flicker lateral from John Riggins, but before he could deliver the ball downfield, he was hit by two defenders. On the replay, viewers saw one of the most gruesome sights ever shown to football fans. And of course, I think it was after that that they kind of stopped showing that kind of stuff. Of course, us football fans are going, we want to see that gruesomeness because um, we're, you know, sort of sadists. Uh, Theismann suffered a very nasty compound fracture to his leg. This injury ended the quarterback's uh, career. Who were the two defenders who combined for this memorable sack? Well, Lawrence Taylor would be one of them, but yes. is Leonard, Leonard Marshall, is he the other one? No. Not Leonard Marshall. Not Leonard Marshall. Who was Did the other Bert? one? No. It was Harry Carson. Harry Carson. Harry Carson. For the Number Giants. 53. Yeah. That's right. Uh -huh. Okay. Hey guys, I've got some fun long thoughts for the day. Here we go. Obstacles are things a person sees when he takes his eyes off his goals. And life before a computer, a memory was something that you lost with age. An application was for employment. A program was a TV show. A cursor was a, used profanity. A keyboard was a piano. A web was a spider's home. A virus was the flu. A CD was a bank account. A hard drive was a long drive, long trip on a road. A mouse pad was where a mouse lived. And if you had a three and a half inch floppy, you just hope nobody found out. All right, <laughs> tune, in, <laughs> tune in this week to Sport Econ 101. We're going to be discussing sport topics from a business perspective and asking more sports trivia questions. Thanks for listening. On behalf of our team, I'm your host, Edward Brown. We'll see you next week. Adios, America. So long. <laughs>